Hey guys, what's a language you've always wanted to learn and why? I've always wanted to learn a Slavic language, any Slavic language, uh, because no. in my childhood, they felt like basically like communist languages, you know, Ruski <laughs> and Polski, <laughs> and they were mostly inaccessible behind the Iron Curtain. But nowadays, for me anyway, they're, they're near. I mean, I can hop on the train here in my hometown in the morning and change trains in Germany and be in Poland in the evening. So Polish is much nearer to me, geographically speaking, that is, than, than sure. Spanish or Swedish. But as long as I don't know anything, or as long as I didn't know anything about Slavic, Poland felt as culturally remote as, say, South Korea or even mm, South Dakota. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's a fun answer. Kyle? I always wish I had learned Spanish, which is like I know a little bit from, you know, middle school and high school that I use at work every now and then. But Man, people look at me like I got three heads and I, I just have to apologize every time I talk to them, you know. <laughs> and what about you, Emily? You got any? I, I've always felt like German would be a fun language to learn. And I couldn't really tell you why. I think it just sounds good. And I feel like it, it feels attainable because English is Germanic. Feels within reach. I guess, which is sort of the opposite. Gaston wants to do something that feels out of reach, and yeah. I want to do something that feels easy. <laughs> Different size of the to-do list you guys start at. That's right. <laughs> Welcome to Butter No Parsnips. Every week on Butter No Parsnips, your hosts Emily Moyers and Kyle Imperator take you on an adventure through the weird, wacky, wonderful, and sometimes even wicked world of one wayside word. Strange characters, delightful bits, and general joyousness abound. Join them as they test each other's etymological expertise. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Butter No Parsnips. I'm Emily Moyers. And I'm Kyle Imperator. And Emily, I am voracious for a word. <gasps> Kyle, that is sensational because today I've got a great one. Excellent. Kyle, your word today is polyglot. Polyglot. Oh, Emily, this is great because not only do I know the definition of this word, oh. I have a prime example of one right here. Uh, you do, don't you? This is a regular occurrence. Yeah, I always <laughs> do, Emily. You should know by now. <laughs> Everybody, please welcome linguist, journalist, and polyglot Gaston Doran to the show. Hi, Kyle. Hi, Emily. How are you? Gaston, thank you so much for being here today. Maybe you'd like to give yourself a more personalized introduction than I just gave. <laughs> oh, well, uh, you introduced me as a polyglot and I can only plead guilty, but I'd rather <laughs> say that I'm a journalist and a writer who happens to have acquired some languages, and mostly through necessity. Uh, I was born and bred, and I'm still based here in the Netherlands, which you may better know as that European country around Amsterdam. And <laughs> in my daily life, I speak mostly Dutch. That's the language that gave English words such as uh, measles and boss and Brooklyn. And at some point in my life, I've contracted a benign obsession with languages. There are six or seven that I can speak somewhat, but there are six or 7,000 that I cannot speak, but I can still write <laughs> about those, right? And then I will write stories about them, whole books are full of true stories, so to speak. And to my delight, and a bit to my surprise, loads of people <laughs> want to read those stories. So as long as they and you don't stop me, I'll keep at it. <laughs> <laughs> We're not going to stop you. Yeah. No, absolutely not. <laughs> Gaston, to get things started, would you like to tell us all what a polyglot is? And then maybe I can sort of fill in the etymo etymological blanks. All right. A polyglot, I would say, is a bilingual plus. Uh, I mean, a bilingual is a person who speaks one language beyond their mother tongue, right? And most people in the world, we, we're not always aware of that, but most people in the world actually are bilinguals through necessity. And a good number of those bilinguals speak one more language, which I think makes them polyglots. And the more languages they speak, the more poly they are. Uh, if I had a parrot, I would probably call it polyglot and then teach it swear words in several languages. <laughs> <laughs> What a we fantastic a goal. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, that would be great. <laughs> yeah. So that, that pretty much sums it up. Polyglot comes from the Greek polu, meaning many, 
and the Greek glotta, meaning tongue, many tongues, many languages, person who speaks a lot of languages, which you do. Well, yeah, uh, as I said, I speak only one in thousand. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it's many to me who speaks one. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but it, I know, you know, it's, I'm, I'm really a victim of circumstances. Uh, I mean, at home, uh, as, as a little, well, as a baby, really, I was taught something called Limburgish, Limburgish, which is a regional language in the Netherlands and Belgium. And that's what my parents spoke. Then I somehow picked up Dutch, I guess, thanks to TV and kindergarten. Mm. And then in secondary school, I was made to study English and French and German, like most Dutch kids. And then as a graduate student, I was to spend half a year in Peru. So in preparation, I studied Spanish. And, and those are the languages that I can have a conversation in now, uh, though French speakers really have to be pretty tolerant um, when <laughs> when I tried to do that. And then I did try to learn some other languages after that for a hobby, but those efforts were mostly fruitless, I should say, well, like Vietnamese and Turkish. And I'm actually getting places in Polish. That's 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 a surprise. That's the first time in, in over 30 years that I'm really making advances. I can read children's book in Polish now. And if Polish people talk really slowly and they are willing <laughs> to say everything three times, we can have a terrible conversation. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm childishly proud of that. Do you have any, I mean, that's that's wonderful. I was reading a bit from your book, Babel, about your studies in Vietnamese. And, you know, it's fascinating to see your experience learning a new language and, you know, your frustrations with it, especially, you know, having studied previous languages. Mm -hmm. Do you intend to learn any other languages past Polish? I, I've been trying to stop myself from learning new languages and, and failed at that as well. I mean, <laughs> Polish is definitely... Uh, a bad transgression. <laughs> Even the ones that I have not mastered, not by a long chalk. I mean, like Vietnamese, I've really forgotten everything about Vietnamese, but I've made friends there and I've visited the, the country and I've discovered new things about language generally by studying a language that is so far from being, you know, European. What do you think it keeps sort of spurring you in that quest? What makes it hard for you to stop wanting to learn new languages? Well, I guess it's simply intellectual uh, curiosity, for one thing. I really love it when I discover new things about uh, languages. When I Now, in Polish, I discover that it, has, it shares a lot more in common with German than I expected. And frankly, a lot more than most Polish people know, because they don't, <laughs> speak, because they don't speak German, <laughs> so they wouldn't know that. Sure. And of course, there is the obvious answer that it's just fun to talk to people in or from those countries. I mean, I really enjoy my conversations with my Polish language buddy. Yeah, I took Italian in high school, and I've lost most of it. And when I was working retail, every so often, I'd hear people I was ringing up speaking Italian. And I'd always want to like, give them their total in Italian just to say, hey, I know your language a little bit. <laughs> it is sort of exciting when you can like reach out to people in that way. It is. It is definitely. What do you think has been the hardest part about learning a new language. Does it get easier the more you learn about a language? You know, picking up on linguistic patterns, that sort of thing? Yeah. Grammatically speaking, yes, I do feel it gets easier, especially yeah. as long as you stay within the realm of European languages. Sure. Like, uh, I mean, Vietnamese is really a, a, whole, a whole other kettle of fish. Sure. Mm -hmm. But as for your question, what is the hardest part of learning a new language, I think that's uh, to, to a degree that depends on the person. For me, it's two things. Uh, one is understanding the spoken language. I'm pretty terrible at that. I mean, I can read fairly complex stuff in French and I can understand a newspaper in Polish, but speech is you get a slush of sounds with, with no spaces in the middle. Yeah. And it takes me a long time to get used to that in any new language, especially now that I'm getting older and my ears aren't getting any better. But that's, <laughs> oh. And the other thing is uh, vocabulary. And I'm not saying it's hard, but there's just such a lot of it. I mean, grammar and spelling are things that you can analyze and understand. And that's something I'm good at. I'm good at analyzing. And pronunciation, too, is something that I find a nice challenge. I mean, I think I have flexible lips. But vocabulary is basically just one bloody word after another. And uh, <laughs> of course, there are patterns, and I try very hard to find those, you know, with suffixes and prefixes and related words and other languages. But in the end, it's a grind, and it really takes a lot of grit to, to continue there. 
do you confuse words and languages? Like, are you like, do you speak Polish and th- and say, you know, German, like confused vocabulary words there? I do, though not this particular example. I confuse words in my worst language with my second worst language. <laughs> Strangely, now in Polish, I sometimes use Spanish words, even though I would say that I'm fairly fluent in Spanish. But instead of saying uh, tak, which means yes, I will say si, which doesn't make sense. <laughs> and it, it happens less and less, I should say. But yeah, in a general way, it, it does happen uh, occasionally. Interesting to, to yeah. mix up languages that seem so far part. But I guess, you know, if, if any of it is not your mother tongue, you would just sort of be grasping for anything that means yes, if you're in that moment but of I panic. But I would never use an English word in Polish. I mean, those two, to my, I don't know, in, in, in my brain, they're just, they're just nowhere near each other. <laughs> That's so interesting. Have you tackled languages that have different alphabets, like, like you know, Cyrillic or, or Arabic? Because that must be like an entirely other mountain to climb. Yeah, I did try Russian for a while. I didn't like it all that much, so I gave up. But the alphabet is not really a major. It's a bit of an obstacle. But when it comes to writing, what's more important than for a language to have the Roman alphabet is to have a spelling system that makes sense. I mean, and the Cyrillic alphabet is is pretty easy. And I think the languages that use it, like, like Russian and Bulgarian and some others, Ukrainian, are generally spelled more or less phonetically. Not entirely, it's never entirely, but more or less. There's also Arabic, which I never tried, but that's hard for different reasons. The the vowels are mostly missing. But of all the languages that have an alphabet at all, Roman or Cyrillic or whatever, English is probably among the very, very worst because its spelling, well, as I need to explain you, is such an utter mess. (laughs) It is. I mean, it's not complete bedlam. There are some rules of thumbs, even in English, but even calling it a spelling system would be... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that would be flattery. That would be flattery. <laughs> yeah, we do have rules, but every rule has an exception. And, yeah, yeah, and that exception also has some exceptions. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and the funny thing is that for that reason, English pronunciation is a mess too, I've noticed. I, I mean, one of my books, uh, Babel, many people call it Babel, even though there's only yeah. one B in the middle. Yes. I, I mean, I'm really completely unable to understand how people can say <laughs> Babel. <laughs> Uh, That is a fair point. (laughs) Absolutely. Now, you've brought up one of your books, which I unfortunately am going to continue to pronounce Babel because that's what it looks like to me. (laughs) Oh, really? (laughs) Uh, Yeah, because that's what we like. It is B-A-B-E-L as in Uh like the Tower of Babel. But in America, we still we call it the Tower of Babel. It is Babel. But and your other book is Lingo. Both of those books have been translated to English and as I understand it, have sold very well all over the world. They're fantastic books. I took a look at both of them. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Yeah. Uh, They are both essentially journeys through space and through language. Can you share for the audience a little bit about the ideas behind those two books? Yeah. um, Yeah. Journeys through space and language. I I quite like that description. Uh, (laughs) And uh, and through time, I would also add as a third journey. Yeah. uh, Babel in particular has quite a few historical chapters, journeys through time, but not all of them. The, The book is about the 20 most widely spoken languages in today's world. The smallest of them is Vietnamese, the one that I tried to learn and failed, (laughs) all the way up to to English. And Lingo, on the other hand, is about all the languages of Europe, which of of course um, includes the four largest languages of the Americas, uh, English, Spanish, Portuguese, and French. So, as I said earlier on, I like to write stories, true stories, nonfiction, and Babel and Lingo give the reader exactly that, uh, stories about uh, about history, about uh, the societies in which these languages are spoken, about uh, relations between languages, about the families to which they belong, the writing, the sounds, even the grammar. I try to make the grammar accessible. It's really a hodgepodge of very different elements in both books. Lingo, uh, when I was reading through it, I was impressed by how digestible each chapter was as kind of a little short story about a uh, language and about the history of that language. Why do you think there is so much narrative to find in the study of language? Yeah, I think it's because language is so central to our being human, to our to our humanity, that there are links between it, between language, and pretty much 
any other <laughs> human related subject, which of course <laughs> is nearly every subject. So <laughs> in almost any field of human endeavor, let's say, there are certain language related stories from navigation to law and from psychology to war and from politics to sex or you name it. Language plays quite a big role in our feeling of identity and in our sense of belonging to a nation or a community or a tribe or any other group, which produces lots of different potential narratives. Yeah. So, you know, as you've taken these journeys through space and through language and through time, there must be a few sort of standout narratives or adventures you've come across. Are there any you'd like to share that are, may or may not be in the books? Yes, I, I'll be delighted. One that <laughs> uh, is in the book, actually, and it was already mentioned, is my adventure trying to learn Vietnamese, which is the initial chapter of Babel or Babel. And it's it's, it's very much, I would I sometimes describe it as a success story of a failure because <laughs> I failed dismally at conquering the language, but it taught me a lot about languages. Uh, it taught me how similar all European languages are. It also taught me that so similar similarities, yes, I'm really saying that, similar similarities <laughs> exist between the languages of East Asia. And I noticed because my Vietnamese friends found it very easy to learn conversational Chinese, Mandarin, which is oh. very, very hard for speakers of European languages. You can see many traces of each European language in every other European language. Mm -hmm. The other adventure that I that springs to mind now is very different. It's with a language called NGT, which oh. is the sign language of the Netherlands. So it's like oh. ASL, but ASL is American Sign Language, right? But yes. different countries have their own sign languages. Ours is called NGT, NGT, which is, I mean, it's very similar to ASL in some ways, but they cannot communicate easily with each other, the speakers of the sure. users of these sign languages. Right. And it, to me, it was very strange to realize that sign languages as a group are so rich and so up to the job that they need to do, mm -hmm. while at the same time being so utterly, utterly different from my own, uh, from my, you know, English or Dutch, whatever. And it was extremely interesting to find that our bodies, that is, our hands and faces mostly, can convey, can express all the things that our mouths can convey. And really, if you stop to think about it, it makes perfect sense because, well, our hands and faces can make as many and probably more different movements than our mouth scan. Yeah. So once you start codifying these movements and attaching stable meanings to them, you have endless options, uh, endless mm, potential for expressing meaning. But as a hearing person, I'd, I'd never realized that before. It was <laughs> it was almost literally a an eye opener to me. Um, so far, I'd only listened. And now it turned out that my eyes could also do language. <laughs> yeah, it really makes you reconsider what language means you know very it's much not just so words. yeah it's not just words it's not just spoken words i mean signs are also words right and it also has grammar and has all of that but it's yeah it's more than just the sounds of words you touched on how similar all uh european languages are but we discussed before we recorded that english is very unique in how diverse it is and i see that a lot when we cover uh, words on the podcast that are not from germanic or romantic roots that are, are reaching further afield because those episodes let us highlight how diverse English is. Can you talk about that aspect? English is very special in that respect. I mean, it's not unique in the literal sense that there's only one of them. There are other languages right. with lots and lots and lots of uh, borrowings, like Armenian, for instance. But English history is very special. I mean, in the early Middle Ages, uh, English and no other language than English borrowed all these words from the Vikings, right? Like, like egg and big and take and cake and yeah, you know, goes on and on. There yeah. are these everyday words now, dozens of them. And then from the 11th century on, it underwent this massive influx from Northern French, you know, after 1066, William the Conqueror, all that. And then both during and after the Middle Ages, so let's say, I don't know, many centuries, during many centuries, English borrowed loads of Latin words. Uh, many European languages did that, but English really took it to extremes. I don't know why, but it really took it to extremes. So in terms of vocabulary, it really began to resemble a Romance language like French or Spanish. Yeah. But interestingly, <laughs> this implies that uh, you as English speakers, as native English speakers, and, well, I, I take it that you both are, uh, today know a lot of Germanic vocabulary, 
both indigenous, that is to say, West Germanic and Scandinavian, that is to say, North Germanic, and also a lot of Romance vocabulary, both French and Latin. And that's without mentioning the words from Greek, mostly in the scientific realm, you know, like psychology and analysis. And, and then yeah. there are the words from all over the world, such as coffee and safari and sushi and tundra, and et cetera, et cetera. So as English speakers, you really have a head start when it comes to learning vocabulary. Think of that uh, and uh, take advantage yeah. of it. <laughs> yeah, it's true. We, we really don't take advantage of it, but yeah. we do have a lot of uh, handholds in a lot of places. Yes, exactly. Yeah, I'm imagining what learning... Icelandic might be if the only word I know is geyser. <laughs> when you're starting from there. Well, you would still find a lot of Germanic words that you will also find in English. I mean, English has lost many Germanic words, but there are still many thousands of them. And you will find those in Icelandic as well. And at some point, you start to recognize them, I'm sure. Well, Gaston, you know, the three of us are chatting today from across the planet, which is a marvelous invention <laughs> that we mm -hmm. get to do. So mm -hmm. in our increasingly connected world, you know, technologically, do you see languages starting to be pulled closer to each other? Are they becoming more alike? Yeah, in some ways they are, but that's actually been going on for ages, even without modern technology. As I said before, most European languages uh, show very clear signs of being European, well, I didn't quite put it like that, but there were many similarities, I said, and that's in the sense that they share a lot of vocabulary and a lot of grammatical patterns. That's less obvious, but there are many grammatical patterns that they show. Now, that's partly because their relatives, right, Germanic Romance, or even remote relatives like Indo-European. I'm sure that the listeners to this show do not get a start when they hear the word Indo-European, but <laughs> that's the least of it. They've also influenced each other. I also mentioned that because there were so many bilinguals in Europe through the ages because they had to travel or they had to trade or, they, or there was warfare and diplomacy. And there's also a shared literary history. Christians, and during for many centuries, most Europeans were Christians. They were familiar with the story from the Bible. And then all intellectuals were familiar with the Latin and Greek classics in the original or in translation, and also with some great European authors such as Dante and Cervantes and Moliere and Goethe. And now you're waiting for me to say Shakespeare, so I will. <laughs> I will say Shakespeare. So that has led to all these languages pulling together, as you said. And nowadays, with modern communications technology, that's a new step. So yeah, I agree. But it's not a new process. It's kind of amazing how embedded culture is into the development of language mm -hmm. and how that affects other languages and other cultures, you can't really separate the two, can you? The language and the culture, th that's right. I mean, there's, certainly the culture is expressed in the language. At the same time, uh, look at Ireland. Ireland has always, what used to be an Irish-speaking country, and the Irish language was the, the carrier, so to speak, of Irish culture. Nowadays, it's mostly English-speaking. But there's still Irish culture, and I'm sure it has changed somewhat, but Irish culture has survived that language shift. So mm -hmm. I agree that, yes, language and culture are closely connected, but we shouldn't overstate it. I mean, sure. culture can survive even in a different language with some losses. Sure, but then I would imagine, in turn, the culture impacts the language because there are probably ways in which Irish people have impacted English that they might not have otherwise. Yeah, um, I guess I know that the pronunciation of Irish, which is not what you're what you're referring to, the pronunciation of Irish has impacted Irish English. It's hard for me to say if Irish culture has influenced Irish English in other ways. I'm sure it has, but I, I couldn't give you any examples. I'm sure there are other people know much more about that. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair enough. That's fair enough. Probably everybody knows more about that than I do. <laughs> everybody in Ireland. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and people have also made attempts to make a sort of universal language to like bridge that gap across the entire planet. You know, a constructed language like Esperanto mm -hmm. tried to make just like a universal second language. What is your take on an endeavor like that? It was a good idea at the time. It was also 
uh, done very well. I mean, Mr. Zamenhof, Dr. Zamenhof made a good job of it. It's, it's, it's a great language. But we no longer need it. I mean, for the time being, we have an auxiliary language, a second language in English. Well, it's, it's a first language for you, but it, uh, it's a second language for most people in the world. Mm-hmm. While English has its flaws, I mean, I can speak about those at length, but it, uh, and, you know, terrible spelling, certain phonological drawbacks, it will definitely do for the moment. And I love it. I mean, I'm very fond of English. But a generation from now, well, according to my crystal ball and according to many linguists, will probably have a fully functional Babelfish, that is to say, automatic interpretation, you know, some gadget or some application that will interpret for us. So, for instance, I would, in that case, I would be speaking Dutch right now. And thanks to this future Babelfish, you would be hearing those same words in English. And if that comes to pass, and I think it's very likely, many fewer people will be learning English than is the case nowadays. So in the future, I guess there's no Esperanto and a lot less of English as a second language and a lot more of this, well, I call Babelfish because that's from this, uh, the Hitch- Hitchhiker's Guide to the Universe, right? Sure, right. Uh, call it what you like. But that will be a game changer. I hadn't even considered that, but I, I guess with the advent of AI in the past, you know, couple years, uh, the the language game is bound to change pretty quickly. Yes, I think so. Well, at least in terms of translation. I mean, I have, uh, like everybody else, I've played around a bit with the best known AI that is uh, uh, publicly available, and it is absolutely terrible at answering <laughs> questions about linguistic. It's absolutely unreliable. It gives yeah. wrong answers most of the time. But when yeah. it comes to translating it, that's a different matter. It's pretty good at that. That is interesting that it can do translating, but not the sort of meta knowledge around yes, language. Exactly. Yes. I've been thinking while we're talking in Babel or Babel, you talk a lot about how, you know, for better or worse, these 20 most spoken languages are sort of rising in prominence where more insular indigenous languages are falling in speakers. Do you think if we get this sort of Babelfish technology, those indigenous languages might come on the rise again? It will take away one sort of pressure, yes, but I'm not sure that the, I'm not just not sure, I don't know, if there's Babelfish will be available in all 6,000 or however sure. many will be left at the, uh, by then. Maybe it is. Maybe it, maybe it will be available in, in all of them. I just don't know. But it will probably start from the top. I mean, the, the uh, biggest languages will be served first. And then I don't know how, how much... Uh, it will go down through that pyramid right. of size. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Will, uh, will, you know, little tribes in South America get their language translated? Yeah, and not knows? only that, there are so many languages. Okay, like I, I mentioned at some point that uh, I grew up speaking Limburgish, which is a regional language, but it doesn't, yeah. that regional language doesn't have a standard. So there's only lots of local dialects. And as a person, I don't have any trouble speaking to somebody from the same province who lives 10 villages away from me. But I'm not sure if this device will be capable of doing that. I just don't know. Mm, And that situation exists in many, many languages. There are far fewer standard languages than there are languages. (laughs) Right. Just little little differences in, you know, pronunciation or vocab that are just that we make those jumps. Yeah. Yeah. I remember these fairly hilarious uh, videos where people would be speaking in Scottish English uh, to some lift, to some elevator, and the lift would be uh, clueless because it wore, it spoke English or it understood English, but not Scottish English. So that's, that's sort right. of a similar situation. Yeah, and languages like change over time too. So unless, you know, it, it's, I, I imagine that's difficult to build into an AI learning model, you know, unless somebody's telling it this is how it's changing. Uh, yeah, but I don't think anybody would have to tell it. I mean, those changes go uh, gradually, right? I mean, because grandchildren can sp- still speak to their grandparents. So th- those changes are not all that wide and not all that huge. And since these AIs are learning systems, I think they can handle that. That would be my guess anyway. Sure. Yeah, you seem like a pretty globally minded person, Gaston. <laughs> uh, you seem to travel a lot. Uh, where have been some of the places that you've enjoyed the most? I 
yeah, glo- how did you put that? Globally minded, you said? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's, yeah I, I like that, uh, Monica. Um, I don't travel all that much anymore because here in Europe we have something called flying shame, shame of flying. Many of us oh. do. And we try to avoid flying if it's at all possible and take trains and not travel more than necessary. You know, global warming and all of that. Uh, oh, global sure. climate crisis. Uh, mm-hmm. I don't think that concept has reached the United States and yeah, I boy, think it would everyone be everyone in the world is so much better than us <laughs> no that's not what I'm trying to say what I'm trying to say is but that it's the, the truth <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I know from American friends that you just have to take planes to get places. I mean, yeah, I can yeah. see that. I can. I, I, that makes sense, right? Anyway, so well, there's enjoying, and there is being glad that I've done it. Uh, I sure. mean, I spent half That's a fair. year as a student. I spent half a year in Peru. I met so many nice people, and they taught me such a lot of things that I wouldn't have missed for the world but i did have a hard time there and in spite of that i mean i was lonely and i was miserable uh, for weeks on end and still i'm happy that i did it it was like i guess that's what what growing up feels like <laughs> yeah <laughs> you just did that in peru <laughs> growing up you mean no nah, yeah i only spent that half year growing up the rest of the time i was sort of, I was sort of stagnant <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can relate to that. Yeah. And there's one thing that I like a lot about Europe. I mean, I, ah, being European is something that I first discovered in Peru, which was the first time I was outside Europe. I mean, up until then, I thought of myself as a Dutch person. And after that, I've sort of thought of myself as a European person. And I did discover that there are so many things that are very European, not just this linguistic diversity, which you will also find in other continents, but less in, in, in the big English-speaking countries, of course. I mean, I take it for granted that when I travel somewhere, there is a city, there will be a, a church in the middle, and when I travel along a river, there will be a castle somewhere, and when I make a walk, there will be a village every three or four kilometers, every two or three miles, and that is what the world is like to me. But when I'm outside Europe, I'll discover that that is not what the world is like. That's just here. (laughs) I I like things the way they are here. And I'm not saying that I'm better. I really don't. I'm I'm really not saying that. Not at all. But it is the way I like them. (laughs) Yes. I I found that I spent three months living in England and I had never... I still don't think of myself as a particularly patriotic person, but being out of my country, I mm-hmm. suddenly felt like voraciously defensive about every <laughs> every custom that is mine. <laughs> yeah, so you really felt an American as soon as you left America, and I, I saw the European as soon as I left Europe. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah no, I, I think that's really wonderful to hear. I don't get out of the country very often. I think I can't even remember the last time I was out of the country. So uh, I think I need to... Uh, Find some places to visit and get some other perspectives. Maybe I'll return and I'll be like, wow, Long Island is the best island on the planet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I often hear that Americans, I, they, they often say to me that they are a bit embarrassed, that they're typically monolingual. But then I think that's only... That makes a lot of sense for Americans to be monolingual because all you hear around yourself is is mostly English, right? And then the occasional yeah. newcomer who will speak their mother tongue. But it, I mean, all major communities, all, well, all states definitely are English uh, language states. So uh, whereas if you live when I, where I grew up in, the, in my southern tip of the Netherlands, French was a just uh, 10 miles away from me and German was 15 miles away and there were two right. varieties of Dutch nearby and there was this regional language and there was English on television and my father was a French teacher. So, I mean, if you live hereabouts, you you are exposed so much to other languages. So, I mean, it's really, uh, when I say that uh, it was necessity that made me learn languages, I really mean that. And yeah. it's also the lack of necessity that makes Americans, but also British English speakers and Australians, mostly monolingual. I mean, I do encourage people to learn a second language, but there's just no need for most English speakers. So Mm -hmm. I fully, fully sympathize with those of you who are monolingual. There's Mm -hmm. really no shame attached to that at all. Still, it's fun to learn. Yes. (laughs) Yes. And I think there are a lot of Americans who who wish they knew more than one language and are trying to on, you know, Duolingo or or yeah, speaking yeah. tables at their libraries or whatever. Mm-hmm. Do you have any advice? Like what's something that you think someone 
learning a new language should know about learning languages? Uh, I think it's, it's kind of getting yourself into a situation where you really need it. That may be the mm-hmm. most important thing. Okay, like Vietnamese, I decided I would go and learn Vietnamese, but there was never really a need for me to master it. Whereas a person, a Spanish person I know, lived in Vietnam for seven or eight years, and he did learn it quite decently. I mean, he wasn't fluent. He wasn't, he didn't speak it as if it were a European language. And every Vietnamese person could tell, ah, he's European, he's a foreigner. Mm. But he could have conversations. He would understand most of the things Vietnamese people said to him, if not necessarily among each other. So necessity is really very important. And then there are loads of technical advice that I could give. But you can find that in every book about language learning. And this necessity is the, is the bit that often gets neglected a bit. Putting yourself in survival mode is <laughs> the best way to figure that out. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. And by all means, pre- prepare before you go to a place. You don't want to be in survival mode and then die after all. <laughs> like actual literal survival mode. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But that, I think that's the major thing. Uh, and I was talking uh, about uh, Americans speaking, being mostly m- monolingual. I should add that one of my best friends is American, living in one of the central, one of the southern states, and he speaks like seven or eight languages. So I'm fully aware that there are American polyglots as well. And that's uh, all the more admirable. I mean, this, this guy is really great to listen to in all these languages, <laughs> some of which I understand and some of which I don't. <laughs> <laughs> but appreciate. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Well, this has been a fantastic conversation, but Gaston, we always like to cap our episodes with a little game. Uh, Does that sound like something you'd be into? Um, Well, I I love games. I mean, I contributed to this this language game, uh, the League of the Lexicon. So yeah, uh, just tell me what game. (laughs) All right. So today we are playing a game which Seth is entitled Constructed International Auxiliary Quiz. (laughs) (laughs) Constructed International Auxiliary Quiz. Yes. I feel like uh, this is some sort of government uh, (laughs) quiz that we have to take. (laughs) Well, you know, we were racking our brains over a game that wouldn't set Kyle up for a swift defeat. You know, a defeat for sure, but maybe we'll (laughs) slow it down. So today we are going to be talking about everybody's favorite Constructed International Auxiliary language, Esperanto. Ah. So we'll learn a little bit about it through the game, but Esperanto, as we mentioned earlier, is a language created by Ludwig Zamenhof. I hope Mm -hmm. I'm saying that right. That was originally designed for ease of learning and use with a goal of fostering international understanding and peace, a noble goal. What mm-hmm. you guys don't know is I'm actually fluent in Esperanto. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to learn real quick. <laughs> well, I got bad news, Kyle. This is a trivia game, so I don't know how much oh. it's going to help you. <laughs> but my hope is that the uh, notoriety and obscurity of this language will contribute to a more level playing field betwixt the two of you. Okay. That and also the fact that it's going to be multiple choice. So basically, all I have here are some questions about Esperanto. <laughs> are you two ready? I'm ready. Ready, Eddie. All right. First question. In which year did Ludwig Zamenhof introduce Esperanto to the public? 1828, 1887, 1931, or 1994? Oh, boy. I thought it was something else entirely. Are you sure? I can confirm it is one of those four options. Okay. It's not uh, 1699. <laughs> yeah, it is. I know that it's either B or C, but really for the life of me, I would have thought it was in the middle somewhere. Let's go for B then, the late 19th century. All right. Oh, Kyle, how are you boy. feeling? For the sake of being different, <laughs> I'm going to go with C. That was what, the 1930s? Yeah, 1931. Yeah, I'll go with 1931. Well, Gaston was correct. It is hey. 1887. <laughs> I thought it was later, so I would have get I would have got it wrong if if that had been an open question. Fair enough. Uh, yes, uh, Esperanto was introduced in a book by Zamenhof titled "Doctor Esperanto's International Language," and it wouldn't come into use until around 1889. What? So, wait, are you, you telling me now right? that the book had an English title? I can't believe that. 
I, I, lo- I was looking at the cover today and it's, but maybe it was translated. Ah, I see. <laughs> or he, he was trying to get the most people. If he just wrote it in Esperanto, no one would have known what it meant. <laughs> it's true. You know? But he might have written it in Polish, which was his language. Yeah, oh, and back that, then he would probably have written it in German, which was, oh. I think, the most international language in Europe at the time. And I'm pretty sure he was fluent in that as well. Fair enough. Yes, but the book is commonly called, ooh, Unua Libro or first book? Uh, Unua? Yeah, first yeah. book. Yeah. 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 So that's one to Gaston. Second question What does Esperanto translate to in English? One who hopes, tongue of many, I dream, or fool's errand? And <laughs> Kyle, I'm going to press you to answer first. Hmm. Seth said again. you have to go first because you're dumber. <laughs> <laughs> Aww. Aww. He said it nicer than that. Uh, can I choose option E, please? <laughs> um, no, I'm going to go. Oh, this is hard. I'm going to go. I think, and this okay. is just my best educated guess based on... <laughs> prefixes and and yeah you can get this i'm gonna go with one who hopes that was a right all right gaston yeah Yeah. you learned spanish in school didn't you say kyle i mean esperando is also mean hoping in spanish yeah 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 yeah, i definitely agree that it must be that you are both correct it means one who hopes nice all right two to one my my high school spanish teacher is going to be so proud of me (laughs) (laughs) we'll call him up all right third question in which country was the world esperanto association universala esperanto asocio originally formed switzerland brazil usa or singapore kyle Ooh. Oh, I have to answer first for all of no, them. Yeah. I I, no, I can also answer first because I have no idea. So mine is just, <laughs> <laughs> mine is just a guess. I'm, I'm, Fair I, enough. I know that until recently there, there was this uh, main this, this headquarters in, in the Netherlands, but apparently that uh, was not oh. back then. Yes, this is uh, where it was originally. Yeah, so I'm just going for sw- with Switzerland because that's where international organizations usually end up. But I have no idea. <laughs> Yeah, I think uh, Switzerland was going to be my guess as well. I, Singapore would be insane, I think. But <laughs> yeah, I, as I, yeah, I understand I'm, it, Esperanto is predominantly based in like European languages. So right. for it to be in Singapore would be very yeah. out of left field. <laughs> well, I have heard that many Chinese and Japanese people learned Esperanto in, in the really? past. Oh. Yeah, it, what, I mean, I guess before the Second World War or so. I'm not sure when, but uh, it was for them a way to gain access to linguistically to, to Europe. Sure, it was like a foothold. In exactly. European. Yeah. Wow, that's fun. But you are again both correct. It is hey. Switzerland. <laughs> We're great, Kyle. We're great. <laughs> yeah, we're, we should do this as a team. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. I want the competition. <laughs> uh, yes, it formed in 1908 by Swiss journalist Hector Hodler. The UEA is now headquartered, as you say, Gaston, in Rotterdam, ah, Netherlands. even today, right. I, yes. thought it, I thought they had closed down, but apparently it's still there. Okay. Uh, no, it has over 5,000 members, has an office in the United Nations building in New York City, and informs its many members of Esperanto goings on through their magazine, which is creatively titled Esperanto. I think I actually remember a reading an issue, not a whole issue of Esperanto. That would be crazy. But one <laughs> of the words that we covered on the podcast had a translation in Esperanto. And like there was like a Google Books found a link to uh, an Esperanto magazine that had it in there. In there. And I was like, wow, there wow. was just a whole magazine in Esperanto. That's great. Yeah, but Esperanto is included in, in Google Translate, I, I noticed the other day. Wow. Uh, so yeah. you could even read that magazine with the help of uh, Google Translate. Oh, I didn't oh even God. think of that. That's awesome. 21st century. Yeah. <laughs> it's amazing. All right. Next one. Which of the following are the two diacritical markings used in the 28 letter oh. Esperanto alphabet? Yeah, this one's a toughie. Is it the tilde and acute accent, the overring and the interpunct, <laughs> the circumflex and the brev, or the longum and the ogonek? That's easy, right, Kyle? 
<laughs> yeah, Kylie, I mean, you obviously know this because you speak Esperanto <laughs> fluently. I mean, I definitely don't know some of those accent marks, <laughs> but I That's do fair. know most of them. I I want to say A sounds the most real to me because those are accents in the Spanish language, and for some reason, Esperanto feels like just if the Sims spoke Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> you know <laughs> alright so you're going with A yeah I think it was C the one I wanted to answer it's the one with circumflex and the other one I can't remember the other one brief or brev, I, something? yeah I'm not positive how you pronounce it it's B-R-E-V-E oh, yeah. uh, and that is correct ah, ah. But, but then I, I have an unfair advantage because as it happens I was only 10 days ago, I was in a place where at some point Esperanto nearly became the official language. And wow. that was the first time in my life that I actually was in that place. It's a tiny part of what's now Belgium. It was called, uh, it's called Morrisnet. It was called Neutral Morrisnet back in the day. That is uh, late 19th, early 20th century. It was a, an area that was shared between Germany, that, well, then Prussia, actually, and Belgium. They couldn't uh, agree on who was to get it, and then they shared it. And that shared area was basically kind of independent. And since it was this, you know, this cute little European country, a bit like Monaco or Liechtenstein, and uh, they, um, somebody came up with the idea, let's make uh, Esperanto the official language here. And they would call it Amisteo, wow. which means place of friendship. I'm not sure if it actually <laughs> happened, but nowadays the tourist business in that place really uh, makes the best of it. And you see all these Esperanto language uh, signs here and there. So and I just happened to be there two weeks ago, first time in my life. This is... <laughs> Hilarious. Yeah. And you guys, <laughs> no, no, you guys will find out why that's hilarious in ah. one minute. <laughs> oh, God, there's a question about it. <laughs> okay, Kyle, I hope you've listened carefully because I'm giving you all the answers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Gaston's not allowed to answer the next one, and this will just be a memory quiz for Kyle. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay so yeah, let's just let me, me let me give kyle time to forget and i'm going to talk a little <laughs> bit about these diacritical markings um oh, yes yeah. so the esperanto alphabet uh excludes q w x and y a circumflex oh. is that little upward pointing carrot you might see uh, over the u in creme brulee which english mm. borrowed from french and a brev is the downward pointing half circle which i don't think we use anywhere ah, in english gaston right. can, do, do you know of an example of that marking no i think i only know it from turkish uh as in i've seen it in turkish <laughs> sure. i don't think it ha it's it's used in english at all or in dutch either oh yeah I mean, it does you show use up it when you're trying to f do cadences and poetry right, right. that's, that's the, the one, one. Sure. Cadence. Yeah. that's the one yes exactly there you go so those those are the two used in esperanto all right, last question. This is just for Kyle. <laughs> Ready? <laughs> I get there a bonus because I'm behind. <laughs> I can tie it up. Oh, no, I can't. I think I'm just no, gone. But you can lose less <laughs> detrimentally. <laughs> yeah, good, good, good. All right, ready? There were yeah. plans in the 20th century <laughs> to establish mm. a small European region between mm -hmm. Belgium, Prussia, and the Netherlands as the world's mm -hmm. first Esperanto state. And mm. actually, you guys can both try to answer this. Which political event prevented this? Was it oh. the Geneva Convention, the end of the Ottoman Empire, the formation of the USSR, or the Treaty of Versailles? Oh, gosh. <laughs> Can it be all of the above? <laughs> <laughs> it cannot. <laughs> well, I mean, to a historian, I'm sure they're all closely related, right? <laughs> sure, yeah. sure, sure. But one one was directly. <sighs> I don't know. I I mean, I'm, I I feel like it's I feel like it's got to be the Geneva Convention. I don't all know. Right. That makes the most sense to me. It sounds wrong, so whatever. <laughs> uh, Gaston, would you like to take a stab at this last one? Well, I think the Treaty of Versailles ended or sort of wound up the, the First World War, and that little piece of land became Belgian for good. So I guess that must oh. be it. Kyle, I got bad news. 
<laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It gave a good answer. <laughs> Gaston is correct. That was the Treaty of Versailles, which awarded uh, that region called, as you say, neutral. Is it Mor- Morrisnet? Morrisnet, yeah. Yeah, but then I, I grew up 20 kilometers from there. So, I mean, this is kind of local history. <laughs> there you go. You had the home field advantage. <laughs> exactly, yeah. exactly. Next time we do a quiz about whatever state you're from, Kyle, and yeah, I'm sure yeah, you'll yeah. win. <laughs> you're going to learn about the Flanders duck and you're going to like it. <laughs> um, yes, and while the next time Esperanto would have a brush with statehood would be on the artificial island micronation Rose Island, the oh. man-made seabound platform was also never officially recognized as a sovereign state. And as of late, the Republic of Molossia uses Esperanto as their official language next to English. However, the Republic of Molossia is also an unrecognized Uh, micronation located outside of Dayton, Nevada in the United Uh, States. (laughs) (laughs) Listen, Kyle, you did the best you could, but you were were squaring up against an expert. I really didn't stand much of a chance. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, Kyle, think of it this way. I mean, my the, the damage to my image would have been so much worse if I had lost. <laughs> he had further to fall. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm glad that I can make you look good. As well. <laughs> You're very generous. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Gaston, thank you so much again for being a guest on the show. It and was great being here. Thank you. Yeah. Before we wrap up what are you up to and where can people find that well we talked about babel babble bobble whatever you want to call it <laughs> <laughs> that is ah, i did mention that it uh, no i should stop the boasting uh, that uh, book is <laughs> this is your time to boast <laughs> <laughs> is it no okay that uh, that's so much not part of my culture but i'll do my best people <laughs> i have to admit in the netherlands this book won a prize the book babel won a prize for the best language book of its year which was i think 2019 but it's also available in English. I mean, the Dutch version got that prize, but sure. it's also available in English. Babel or Babel, uh, about 20 most widely spoken languages in the world, including English and French and Spanish, but also Swahili and Vietnamese and Korean. And there's Lingo, which is about 60 European languages, including uh, the one spoken in the Americas, but more particularly many small languages of Europe that you will never have heard of, right? like Gaga Uz and, and, and Karaim. Wow. And then there is the League of the Lexicon, which is not a book, but it's a game. And I think you have the, the mastermind and another colleague of the League of the Lexicon on the show uh, recently. So that will be the end of this commercial. <laughs> yes, uh, uh, Joshua Blackburn and Jonathan Green, your peers in that endeavor. And what a fantastic game that was and two fantastic books and a fantastic interview. Thank you so much, Gaston. This has been wonderful. Thank you. I've had a very good time and I really enjoyed your questions and the fun we had. Uh, And thank you, listeners at home. Remember, you can find Butter No Parsnips on social media, on Facebook and Instagram at Butter No Parsnips Podcast and on TikTok at Butter No Parsnips. And if you like today's episode, consider giving us a five-star rating or a review wherever you heard us. And if you really like today's episode, consider donating to our Patreon at patreon.com slash butter no parsnips donating five dollars or more earns you a shout out either on social media or right here on the podcast thanks so much to all of you you help us make what we make and with that i have been emily moyers and i've been kyle imperator and you've been gaston Doran all along <laughs> <laughs> and this has been butter no parsnips all along <laughs>